Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Penny Wright. I'm in charge of adult programs here at the library, and we thank you all for being here. We've been waiting for this day for a long time since we heard news of this speaker's a wonderful TED Talk, which happened almost a year ago in Southampton. Um, before I introduce her, though, I wanted to say a couple of things about our library events, of which there are, are many. And I think some of you live in our library district. If you do, you will be receiving our July newsletter in just a day or two, because it's just come out. It's going to be mailed out, I think, tomorrow. Um, we have some June newsletters on the table. We still have a few events left in June. Um, we also have a little events uh, flyer that has a variety of lectures that are happening this summer. Not everything, but many things. So it's worth t picking one of those up before you leave. We also have a July uh, small events calendar that has everything that we're doing and a June so that you can see what's happening for the rest of the month. So we do hope you'll spend just a couple of minutes after uh, after this evening's talk taking a look at, at the, some of the upcoming things that we'd love to have you at. But uh, right now I'd like to tell you about our distinguished guest here, Mary Beth Pfeiffer. She is the leading, the nation's leading investigative reporter on Lyme disease, winning seven awards since 2012 for her reporting on the tick-borne scourge. Her book, which is incidentally for sale uh, on the table in the back, uh, titled The First Lyme, The First Epidemic of Climate Change, has it been endorsed by Jane Goodall and Bill McKibben and praised as superbly written and researched and as a powerful wake-up call. An investigative journalist for three decades, Pfeiffer's reporting has been underwritten by the Fund for Investigative Journalism and the Open Society Institute, which named her a Soros Justice Media Fellow. Her first book, Crazy in America, The Hidden Tragedy of the Criminalized Mentally Ill, documented the inhumanity of prison solitary confinement. Um, a former staff writer for the Poughkeepsie Journal, Poughkeepsie, New York, her Lyme articles have also appeared in Scientific American, the Toronto Globe and Mail, Eon Magazine, Newsday, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and many other publications. And she has been a speaker throughout the United States and in Canada, and I believe in Holland and maybe other places. Please welcome Mary Beth Pfeiffer. Thanks very much. Welcome, everybody. We're going to have a nice chat, talk about Lyme disease, something that I think is probably, unfortunately, all too close to many of you. But it's not just Lyme, as you will learn. Um, I also um, welcome very quick questions if something pops into your head as I'm speaking. No stories, just a real quick thing to keep me focused and maybe answer your question in real time. Um, so, Lyme disease. Okay. First, I just want to define the problem a little bit. Um, Lyme disease cases are up nationwide, and there was a slide before this, but it somehow got dropped. We've seen Lyme disease go from 17,000 cases in 2000 to 42,000 in 2017. Huge increase. Then you have to consider that for every one case that is reported, there's likely about 10 cases total because of underreporting. So we're talking in 2017 more than 400,000 cases of Lyme disease in the United States. That's huge. We also live, unfortunately, in one of the highest Lyme states in the nation. We kind of vie with Pennsylvania for the number one spot. And you'll see that upward line, it's heading north. Um, it was up 32% just in the last year, recorded year. We don't know what 2018 looks like yet. 
Um, but we're talking about 10,000 cases or so in 2017 in New York State, which means about 100,000 people infected. Okay, so now multiplying. <laughs> Um, there's another thing, though, about New York that we need to know, and we'll talk a little bit as I go along about the other things that are in ticks these days. And that is the kind of second leading um, illness, that the, the prime tick that we are aware of, the black-legged tick, um, gives to people. There's other ticks out there, though, too. Um, but babesiosis is um, a, a difficult malaria-like illness. It's a, uh, a parasite, a protozoa. So if you are diagnosed with Lyme disease and that tick also happens to give you babesiosis from the organism called babesia, the antibiotics that you're given are not going to cure you of the babesia. So doctors need to be aware. This is a high babesiosis state. Okay. Now let's just look a little bit about the situation here in Suffolk County. And the news is, is um, a little bit good, but mostly not. Um, and what we're seeing here in this um, slide is that when the state health department goes around the state and it does tick um, flagging, it catches ticks in the wild, in, in fields, and along um, you know, trails and so forth, um, and it counts mm -hmm. how many ticks are out there. And you can see from 2014 to 2017, we have been finding more ticks in given areas of space. This is the number of ticks that were found in a 1,000 square meter area on average. So we've gone from 40 to over 120 in that same space in just four years. This isn't a good, good deal. Uh, development. So more ticks are out there. Now what's in Suffolk County ticks? And right now I am limiting um, discussion to the black legged <clears throat> tick. That's the so-called deer tick, the one that um, we blame for Lyme disease and a lot of other um, diseases. We'll talk about other ticks that are out there too. But for the most part you're going to see, of course, as expected, that Lyme disease is the biggest pathogen the most frequently found in our local ticks. And this is four years of data, so each one of those bars represents a different year, from 2014 to 2017. And you know, you're seeing about, what, what 55 to 70 percent of t adult ticks um, in Suffolk County infected with the Lyme disease bug. Okay, then we move on, we see a lot of them also carry anaplasmosis. It's a, a um, very much a similar um, to Lyme disease illness. Um, it can be very um, difficult in the acute stages. Um, it doesn't seem to have the same problem of becoming chronic or difficult to get over like Lyme disease has. We'll also talk about that. Um, but if it's caught, it can be treated with antibiotics. So we'll see, you know, um, 18 to 20 percent of ticks have that locally. Babesiosis, um, we're seeing ticks with that as well. Um, you know, over 20 percent in 2014. And then on, we have um, another little kind of um, bug out there called Borrelia miyamotai. It's relatively new. It's turning up um, more frequently in ticks. It's something to watch. One of the problems with it is we don't have a test for it. It's very difficult to diagnose. When the doctors test for Lyme, do they test for all of those other things? Or no? um, they generally don't. You have to ask them. Um, but they will if you ask them. If you co uh, you know, go to the doctor with a proven tick bite, with uh, the um, red rash, the so-called uh, bullseye rash, um, ask the doctor. I want to be tested for the other things as well. They can't test you for Miyamotoi without kind of jumping through some hoops and so forth, but it's not a bad idea to look for those other critters. Um, okay. Um, this is just uh, an incidence map. The, basically, what it means is the darker the area, and this is by county, the higher the rates of Lyme disease. Not talking about those other bugs, just Lyme disease. And you'll see that um, you here in, in Suffolk County, you're not the worst. <laughs> we have, believe it or not, higher areas um, of uh, incidence around New York State in particular. 
where I come from, the Hudson Valley, has among the highest rates of Lyme disease in the country, if not in the world. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of good news for you guys. Um, but <laughs> here's a little bit of bad news. And this comes from a study that just came out about a month ago, um, done by Columbia University, in which they looked um, in ticks uh, in the um, Suffolk, uh, Long Island area, as well as, of course, the Sound in Connecticut. And they found Lyme disease in 56%. Um, those other bugs that I mentioned before, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, uh, miyamotoi, they also found Powassan virus in 3.6, uh, maybe about 4% of the ticks. This is a, a very, very dangerous pathogen. Um, about 50% of people who are infected with Powassan virus go on to have um, debilitating neurologic symptoms. Um, there was a death from Powassan virus reported just last week uh, in New Jersey. So it's, it's, uh, it's not a good thing. Um, and Another problem with Powassan is that the tick needs only to be attached to you for about 15 minutes for it to be uh, imparted. Um, Lyme disease, it takes somewhat longer than that, than that a lot longer than that. Um, the other thing is there are things that are in ticks that um, we're finding, and we don't really know what they're doing to human beings right now. We're kind of early on this tick-borne research. We are in fact, kind of way behind the curve, because we haven't taken Lyme disease seriously for a long time. You know, mosquito-borne illnesses, everybody gets really excited because where mosquitoes fly, not so much for ticks. And I'll talk a little bit about why. But anyway, a filarial nematode, which is another way of saying a worm, was found in 14% of the ticks. And there were 14 viruses. Um, all sorts of things. Again, we don't know what these do to people. Um, the other thing about the ticks that we are now seeing in Suffolk County in the eastern uh, end of Long Island, and you have probably seen them yourselves, is something called the Lone Star Tick. It's a nasty tick. They call it um, aggressive. And when I was writing my book, I saw this you know, described in the, the, on the CDC website as aggressive. I thought, what? How can a tick be aggressive? Like it's kind of coming after you. But um, this tick will stalk you. Um, that's another way of putting what the, the Lone Star tick does. Um, whereas the black-legged tick, the way it does its dirty work is it finds a blade of grass or a bit of weed, it climbs up it, and it just waits for a mammal to pass by, and sometimes a human being to pass by. And it can um, detect your breath from 50 feet away, and when you happen to pass by, it just kind of puts those legs out, you know, six of the eight of them, it's holding on, um, and it's hoping to snag a little bit of fur, maybe your pant leg, what have you, and it just latches on. Um, it's just considered a hitchhiker <laughs> in that sense, it just waits. But the um, Lone Star Tick will, you know, you'll be sitting on your uh, lawn or something having a nice little barbecue at a, at a table, and it'll come and find you. It can detect your breath, the carbon uh, dioxide in your, that is, comes out of your body, to a much larger degree and more refined degree than the black-legged tick. Um, and the thing that, uh, about it that's of, of concern, there are a few things. It is causing a mysterious meat allergy. This emerged only maybe five years ago that we, that scientists and physicians started to discover that people who had been bitten five, six, seven weeks earlier, all of a sudden had a hamburger and went into anaphylactic shock, could barely breathe, had to be rushed to hospitals. Severe allergic reactions. And the, um, the State Health Department right now is not counting how many of these reactions that we've had in, at the eastern end of Long Island. But one doctor um, has treated about 400 of them so far. This is based on a Newsday story that I read from last year. So this is, this is a, a, a tick we need to watch out for and be careful of. Um, the other thing it um, gives to people is ehrlichiosis. Similar to anaplasmosis, can be treated 
but you know, all things considered, we'd like to avoid getting it. Antibiotics, yes. <laughs> so I um, call my book The First Epidemic of Climate Change. It's a sort of a gloomy picture. Um, that's actually my backyard. I, I live on a field. Um, and I have a different relationship with that field than I did 35 years ago when I moved there. But anyway, I call my book, the first, I call Lyme disease the first epidemic of climate change. Um, you know, there are other diseases that are being fostered because the world is warming. Um, dengue fever, cholera, malaria. Um, <clears throat> there are also new diseases that are emerging that we didn't know about before, like Zika virus, um, <clears throat> West Nile virus. But Lyme disease compared to all of them, um, first of all, Lyme is, is new. So we've had malaria, we've had dengue fever. Lyme disease is relatively new. It's been out in the environment for a long time, but it's come on like gangbusters in the last quarter century or so. Um, so so that's, that's basically my rationale for calling it the first epidemic of climate change. But just to back up a little bit, um, climate change didn't cause Lyme disease. Right here, we have a, um, a tick that a um, very fortunate and very happy scientist from the University of Oregon found in amber that he purchased in the Dominican Republic. This is fossilized resin from a prehistoric tree. He got this big hunk of amber, brought it back to his, lab his uh, laboratory, sliced it up, and found this tick in it, just like that, that um, mosquito in um, Jurassic Park. <laughs> um, but moreover, uh, you know, this is basically the ancestor of the black-legged tick. Moreover, when he put that tick under a, an electron microscope, what did he find inside of it? What we think is the earliest evidence of Lyme disease, the Borrelia bug, which is a coiled spirochete, very much like what we're seeing right here. So this is considered to be the first evidence of Lyme disease. Okay, so I'm not going to try and seal the deal that things are getting warmer. I'm taking it for granted that you probably understand that, yes, the world is warming. So it's, it's a nicer place, a happier place for ticks. Um, beyond the fact that it's warming, it's also more <coughs> humid and more wet. Ticks really like those kind of factors, warmth and wetness. But there, there are other things that are driving this epidemic. Um, we have adulterated the world in many ways, in ways that have made it um, possible for ticks, uh, for mice, beyond ticks, but for mice to also thrive. We live in these kind of suburban ideals where um, forests have been kind of sliced and diced. You'll have five acres here, 10 acres there. We love to put our houses right up against them, as is mine. Um, but these are places that aren't really in their natural balanced state. We don't, for example, have a lot of foxes to keep those mice under control. And mice are very key in Lyme disease because we call mice, quaintly, the reservoirs of Lyme disease. That's where the Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme disease bug lives happily and just waits to move into a tick. Uh, the tick, when it's born, when it hatches from its mama, two or three thousand eggs at a time, usually goes to a mouse for its first meal and its first sip of the Lyme disease buck. Okay, so as I said, there's fewer um, predators. And over, over to the right there, what you see are the migratory flyways in the United States for birds. So how are these ticks moving around so far and so fast? Migratory birds pick them up in South America, drop them in Virginia, pick them up in Mexico, drop them in New York, all the way up and down um, the, uh, from Argentina in the south, basically, to the Yukon in the north. And I have down here, um, don't blame deer. <laughs> Deer get far, far too much credit for this epidemic. As I mentioned, there's a lot of factors at play. And mice, in terms of 
um, you know, where the ticks are getting infected are far more important than DRR. It's also not very um, realistic to think that we can uh, rid ourselves of deer, and even if we cut them in half, one deer could, could sustain many, many ticks. Okay, so these are all the factors in that perfect storm that, by the way, we have created. It's worldwide, it's climate driven, it's very much underestimated, and it's not under control by any means. It's still um, evolving and moving around. Now, um, and here's one way that it's, it's you know, <coughs> continues to surprise us, frankly. And this looks like a nice little blade of grass with maybe a seed pod on the top. Well, on the top there are hundreds of larval ticks, a new kind of tick called the long-horned tick. It showed up in New Jersey in 2017. We didn't know what it was, where it had come from, it turned up on some sheep, and it is now in seven states. It's in seven counties of New York, including Suffolk County. And we don't know what this tick is going to do or where it's going to go beyond here. We do know that um, the, the State Health Department has um, captured about 128,000 of them so far, has um, looked for pathogens in about 500 of them, and hasn't found any yet. We're wondering if it's just a matter of time before those ticks bite the right thing and pick up the right pathogen and start to move it around. And by the way, this is what happens when you brush up against that little bit of grass. All those ticks, they spread. Um, so the other thing um, that I also mentioned, and I, this is a, a repeated, uh, is that we have new ticks moving in. The Lone Star, um, basically is a tick that has lived in the south for decades and decades, has been known down there, um, and has caused ehrlichiosis, um, but um, all of a sudden it's moving north. It's, it, you know, it survives, it, it, it's happy as a clam in, you know, um, steamy weather in Georgia, in the Carolinas, in Florida, and here it is on the eastern end of Long Island. It's even been found in, in Maine, uh, in New York, in Massachusetts, so you can see it's moving. Okay, um, this is just to make the point with a series of slides about how global this epidemic is. Um, it's in Ireland, it's in Germany, uh, it's in France. You'll see signs like that at the entrance to parks in Paris. Um, it's in the Netherlands, which has a, a really serious problem with Lyme disease, similar to the Hudson Valley of New York and to um, to this area as well. And th this is from a, um, a journal article by a, a Chinese scientist, and it really struck me as, as pretty interesting that, you know, under diagnosis of early Lyme disease and physical damage at an advanced stage are a huge problem. China's not the most open society, but that's a pretty blunt statement about a problem that they have. It's in Australia, where it hasn't officially been recognized because they haven't been able to identify the exact bug that's causing what's called a Lyme-like illness, but there's a lot of people who are sick down there. So this is a, a quote from a, a scientist who read my book, and he called it as macabre as a Stephen King horror novel, except it's actually true. It's not fiction. So at this point, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself um, to kind of um, clue you in as to how I came to this um, and um, how I uh, made my discoveries. So about 30 plus years as an investigative reporter, about four decades as a reporter overall, many series of, of articles, um, many different um, topics that I tackled, including, um, as Penny said, my book on the uh, criminalized mentally ill. I wrote about conditions in New York State prisons in which people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder ended up wrongly in the criminal justice system because we don't have hospital beds for them anymore, and often um, committed suicide in solitary confinement units. That was just one of the um, series that I, that I wrote over time. Um, so I wrote a lot of things. And I, I came at my stories as an objective reporter. If you want to have integrity in this business, 
you have to listen to all sides of, of an issue. You have to consult with a lot of people. You can't have blinders on. You can't have preconceptions. And um, that's how I went into Lyme disease. Um, I didn't have any vested interest. I didn't have a family member who was suffering from Lyme disease. A lot of people who have written about Lyme disease, other books, for example, and I don't put that down, have written about it because they have had chronic Lyme disease or they've had it in their family. I didn't. So I'm sort of the, the ultimate outsider here. Um, and, you know, as an investigative reporter, I had certain things that I looked for in stories. Um, I looked for injustice, you know, who was being screwed by the, the powers that be. Um, I looked for conflicts of interest in government. I looked for a waste of taxpayer money. Um, I looked for um, incompetence, and I found a, a great deal of it in many of the other stories that I wrote. Um, but I didn't expect this in Lyme disease, which is why um, it wasn't until the very end of my career at the Poughkeepsie Journal that I started looking into Lyme disease. I expected a story about you know a growing toll of ticks out there, um, about more people getting sick, um, but you know I thought medicine more or less had a handle on this. I was wrong. So this is um, one of my very first stories, and. Um, Somehow, it winds up being focused on antibiotics. Um, here, I have discovered that I live in an area of the country and the world with the highest Lyme disease rates there are. Really huge revelation to me. was very surprised. But are the powers that be, the people in government and medicine, concerned about the spreading of ticks all over the place? Are they concerned about these sick patients who have to go to 5 and 10 and 20 doctors to get care, to get diagnosed? No. They are focused on antibiotics, and they're focused on doctors who are treating patients with longer courses of antibiotics than mainstream medicine suggests. If you look at the, the prevailing guidelines for Lyme disease, basically you'll see that doctors are told 10 to 28 days of antibiotics for someone who's infected, and that Lyme disease pathogen is killed in your body. It's not there anymore. There's a lot to suggest that that is an incorrect or incomplete view of Lyme disease. And these doctors basically have a different view of Lyme disease. They've treated a lot of patients. They've tried to help people who remain ill even after being initially treated with Lyme disease. But what was, they, oh, what, what, pardon me, what was happening with these doctors? They were being reported to the New York State Office of Professional Medical Conduct, the overseeing office that licenses physicians because of the way they treated Lyme disease. Virtually every doctor who treats Lyme disease in New York State as a specialty has faced the wrath of the OPMC, the licensing board. So let's talk a little bit about how we got here. First of all, there are several myths about Lyme disease. I'm going to cover two of them here. The first one is that we can diagnose it, that we have a nifty test that will tell us if you have Lyme disease. Not so much. Okay, so this is a, a, um, a chart that ran with one of my early stories, which basically tells us how well the um, test performs early on. And basically what you see in the early stage, those red bars, um, which is called the acute stage, 30, maybe 40% of people who have Lyme disease will actually test positive for Lyme disease. That leaves out an awful lot of people who have Lyme disease and who test negative. Um, the test improves as time goes on. And finally, when you get to the late disseminated stage, it supposedly reaches 95 to 100%. There are problems with those numbers and with the studies that they are drawn from. And 
this is just one way to sort of sum that up. There's a, a group of researchers in Europe and they looked at 78 studies of the Lyme disease test. They do these studies in medicine and science all the time. Let's see how well this test works. 78 studies. They wanted to come up with a consensus. How well does this test work? The data in this review do not provide sufficient evidence to make inferences about the value of the tests for clinical practice, mainly when a doctor uses them on a patient. That was probably the single most rewarding uh, sentence I read in 300 scientific papers that I read for my book. Very clear. The test cannot be relied upon. And one of the problems with it, um, every one of those 78 studies, they said, had some sort of bias to it. We don't have anything against which to measure the Lyme disease test. The Lyme disease test that, we, that has been sanctioned by the CDC basically two parts. It looks for antibodies in your body, which basically are um, things that our immune system puts out to fight the infection. And hence, we're not looking for the, the bug itself. We're looking, it's an indirect test to see if these antibodies are there. Some antibodies overlap with other antibodies, so we don't know sometimes whether you have the right kind or the right number and so forth. As an antibody test, it can't say whether you are currently infected or you have antibodies from a past infection. That's a very clear uh, flaw in it. But as far as validating the test, we don't have any way to culture the Lyme disease bug. We can culture lots of bugs. When, you have a, a, um, when your kid has a strep infection, or you have a urinary tract infection, we can grow the bugs in a test tube and we can say, okay, you are definitely infected. We don't have that with Lyme disease, so we don't have a good frame of reference against which to test the test. Okay. Um, this is why this matters. Um, Joseph Alone went to summer camp in 2013 in Rhode Island. He lived in Poughkeepsie. I wrote about him. And he came back a couple of weeks later, and he wasn't feeling well. He went to the doctor twice. His parents brought him to the pediatrician. He was tested for Lyme disease. He tested negative. So he wasn't treated. He had many of the symptoms of Lyme disease. A um, couple of weeks after he tested negative, he collapsed on his front lawn, and he died. The Lyme disease bug had gone to his heart. Um, and this is a um, question and answer from a deposition, a deposition in a, um, a lawsuit against the doctor who didn't treat him for Lyme disease. And the doctor is asked in the deposition, what's the significance to you as a treating doctor of the fact that the antibody test was negative for Lyme? And the doctor responds that he didn't have Lyme at that time. Now, if you looked at that chart, you saw that early on, a lot of people don't test positive for Lyme disease when, in fact, they have it. And the fact that that doctor had that impression goes back to how Lyme disease has been kind of wrapped up in a very neat bow for doctors, particularly primary care doctors. And they're told, trust the test. They're also told, trust the rash. Okay, the, the reasoning goes, okay, we know it's a lousy test, we know it doesn't work early on, but you'll get the rash so we can diagnose you with Lyme disease that way. There's a lot of problems with that as well. For one, not everybody gets the rash. The best case is that 70 to 80% of people get the rash. The actual numbers are probably about half of people get the rash. There are ways in which these um, reports of people with rashes have been fashioned to kind of inflate the figures because doctors have been trained to report Lyme disease because Lyme disease means a rash. There's a lot of people who don't get the rash. And how do we know? How do we prove a negative? Okay. The rash also may not be typical of what we call the bullseye rash. It's the worst name for a rash 
ever. That, you know, central clearing with the red outside. It can be many different things. It can be solid. It can be red at the center. It can have different shapes. It can be a little blistery, a little mottled. So, you know, it may not look like a Lyme disease rash. And I've had patients tell me that their doctor dismissed their Lyme disease rash, that it wasn't a Lyme disease rash. And then they went on to get sick with Lyme disease. Um, the other reason, though, that this test um, really needs to be faulted and changed, we've been using the same uh, test for 25 years, um, is that it's built on that premise of it gets better over time. Okay, so you go to the doctor, you test negative, you might start to feel better. And you don't go back for the retest because you didn't have the rash, you're feeling better. And then two or three years down the line, that, that Lyme disease bug has still been there, kind of hanging out. Maybe it got um, depressed, it got put into hiding by your immune system because that happens. Your immune system does respond to the Lyme disease bug. Um, it also leaves the, the bloodstream very quickly. It doesn't like to hang out in the bloodstream. It, it, um, it, it's, very, it's a very difficult environment for it. And because it's this you know, coiled-shaped um, um, organism, it sort of drills through your, your muscle, through your joint capsules. Um, it can cross the blood-brain barrier. It goes to the eyes. It goes to the kidneys. There's lots and lots of places that this bug has been found in the human body. So this is my, what I was just saying. Do not wait on it. It moves. It disseminates through the body. It also is able to dis uh, disable your immune response. It has certain effects on um, key cells that are responsible for fighting um, infections in your body. Um, as I said, it's been around 15 to 20 million years. It's been able to adapt. Um, it also changes shape. They've done um, studies on uh, the Lyme disease bug that has been um, treated with in, in um, test tubes with a, an assortment of antibiotics. And that's what's called putting uh, environmental stress on the organism. And in response to this stress, it does all sorts of things. But a couple of things that it does is it changes its shape. It becomes these little round bodies. So it's less um, apt to be destroyed by the antibiotic. Um, it also goes dormant. It hides under these little things called biofilms. They're kind of um, sticky, extracellular matrices that um, and enable them to just kind of hang out in the human body for a long period of time. And when the coast is clear, they come out to have fun on another day. And there's a lot of research on persistence of Lyme disease uh, in the medical literature. And um, I have a couple of articles on Huffington, <coughs> Huffington Post if you want to read about that some more. Okay, the, the second major myth um, is that we can cure Lyme disease. Um, and you know, even though that is a very firmly held myth um, in the medical literature, uh, fostered by the Infectious Diseases Society of America and its guidelines primarily, um, the folks who embrace that myth, the folks that say short courses of antibiotics, nothing more, anything else is harmful, they acknowledge that 10 to 20% of people will stay sick a year later after treatment. What's significant about that is these are the people who were treated early. These are the golden cases, you know, the, the people who had the rash, who had the Lyme disease um, test, test positive for them. They're the ones who are the lucky ones. So you take the perfect kind of cohort of people, the people who were diagnosed, the people who were treated, and still, 10 to 20 percent stay sick. Um, that, by the way, is 42,000 to 84,000 people in 2017. That's a lot of people. Um, they did a study at um, New York Medical College, and 5 percent of people still had symptoms 15 years later. You just multiply that year after year after year, and then you add in the people whose diagnoses are missed who are diagnosed late, treated late. 
it's always easier to treat an illness early, isn't it? Um, this is um, a series uh, of slides from a paper that came out um, from Johns Hopkins University a few months ago. And in it, um, we basically see um, the comparison on the, the right um, of the brains of people who suffer what we call post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, that 10 to 20% of people um, who didn't really respond to the antibiotics, who stayed sick. And what you'll see on the right is really nice, very healthy, controlled brains. Um, you want to see a lot of that, that yellow, the pale yellow. The red is uh, inflammation, um, presumably caused by Lyme disease. And these people have been studied um, in other studies by Johns Hopkins, showing that they have severe symptoms of um, pain, of fatigue, um, of um, they can't sleep. There's all sorts of things that, that are associated with, with late stage Lyme disease. These are some of the symptoms that they found. Um, and that's over time. You know, you see a lot of people do get better. Those symptoms um, go down. But there is a, a, a core group that stay sick um, even when the um, guidelines are followed to the, the letter. Now, the other point I, I make is that, and I'm no kind of you know, cheerleader for antibiotic therapy in the long term. Um, I think, however, it's a tool that we have that has really been vilified along with the doctors who use it. Um, and what I did was for my, my book and for this article that I wrote for uh, Newsday last year was, was look at the research that the CDC was relying on to say that long-term antibiotic treatment is a really bad and dangerous thing for Lyme disease patients. And they had posted a bunch of studies. In 21 years, they came up with six studies altogether. That's, that's not a lot of studies. Four of those six were individual cases of people who had gotten, had had, had bad responses to this long-term antibiotic therapy. A few of them had, because um, they had intravenous therapy, um, developed serious infections. A couple of them had died. Um, that's the kind of thing that happens with intravenous therapy that we give for all sorts of other illnesses as well. Um, for some reason, on Lyme disease, this line has been drawn in the sand. No more than 28 days of antibiotics. And it's, it's based on old, flawed science and it's time for a new line paradigm to take its place. There is science that shows it doesn't work and why it doesn't work. In many cases, the Lyme disease spirochete simply survives antibiotic treatment. And the antibiotics that we use, by the way, are not the best ones to be used. We're starting to find that out as well. Doxycycline, not such a great drug for, anti for Lyme disease. So, you know, we have this sort of um, idea about Lyme disease, which is fostered by the CDC, which is fostered by the Infectious Diseases Society, um, that it's really not a big deal, that we know how to diagnose it, and we know how to treat it. And because of this no big deal kind of mentality that pervades Lyme disease, we don't spend any money on it. <laughs> we don't do studies. So I am... Um, did a little search a couple of weeks ago on um, clinicaltrials.gov. That's where they, they track all the research trials um, that are going on worldwide to cure every disease known to human beings. And um, I found when I looked up Lyme disease that there were eight studies now go ongoing or in development. In the entire database, 59, 59 studies. Okay, then I looked up AIDS, because I often compare the two illnesses. They both were pathogens that, that were ident identified early in the 1980s. AIDS in uh, 1983 and Lyme disease in 1981. That's where the parallel kind of ends, because we did what we needed to do for AIDS. And here's the, uh, the result. 
There are 948 studies now ongoing for AIDS. How to treat it, how to manage people who have it, yada yada. 11,000 so far. Now, I'm not saying AIDS doesn't deserve that, but Lyme disease deserves a heck of a lot more attention than it's getting. And this is another way to put it. You can see um, hepatitis C and hepatitis B and malaria and just all sorts of other things have had many, many more clinical trials. How do we solve the problem kind of research than Lyme disease? There basically have been four or five clinical trials on Lyme disease. And they all use pretty much the same um, approach, three months of, of uh, antibiotic treatment, um, and they have all concluded that they don't work. And um, there actually have been reassessments of that work to say, well, we really underestimated how well they worked. Um, so we need to revisit that. And this is also, a, this is another way of putting what I just said. Um, that we don't spend the money on Lyme disease. So Lyme disease all the way over to the right there, 300,000 some odd cases. This is 2016, I think, which comes out to about $133 per case that we spend on research to figure out this disease. Um, 50,000 per HIV case. Um, even West Nile virus, and West Nile is serious, we should pay attention to it, but how many people know anyone with West Nile virus here? When? Okay, how many people know someone with Lyme disease? Yeah, okay. There you go. Um, so, as I said, I don't think antibiotics are the answer, but we need to recognize that we have a problem. We need to do a lot more research. We need a better test. We've been using the same test for 25 years. We have known for a long time that it doesn't work. But because we have a very powerful cabal of doctors and researchers who have got this disease in a stranglehold, nothing has moved forward. They are controlling most of the, um, the debate about Lyme disease, the funding of Lyme disease, the diagnosis and the treatment of Lyme disease. We need treatments that might actually cure people, that might eliminate this infection in the body. We need to find out why people stay sick. And there is a lot of alternative research, by the way, going on right now. Um, we have um, a number of nonprofit organizations that have sprouted up in Greenwich, Connecticut, and outside of San Francisco, um, and um, there's something called the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation. These groups are actually putting up a lot of money to do research on, on what works in treat, treating Lyme disease, in diagnosing Lyme disease, why do people remain sick, and they are actually publishing new research, new findings. I've written a lot about it. Um, but these findings basically are being brushed aside by the prevailing group that controls Lyme disease, not only in America, but in the world. I, I get asked that a lot. She asked, what's, why would they you know, dismiss this new research? They um, have, first of all, invested careers in a certain view of Lyme disease. They, um, so they don't want to kind of you know, uh, rock the apple cart, I suppose. They don't necessarily have it wrong. You know, they do have part of the picture correct. There are people who, maybe 80% of them, who respond to short-term antibiotics, who don't need a longer course of antibiotics, who manifest certain symptoms of Lyme disease, like the rash, like um, joint pain, like headache and fevers and so forth. But there is another view of Lyme disease. And that view that it can cause debilitating, long-term symptoms has simply been brushed aside. What they contend is you no longer have Lyme disease. We killed the infection. We killed the pathogen in your body, so it's not our problem.
What are the people who are ill using for lung disease? Yeah, what when they have lung disease? What are they Well, um, many of them get longer term antibiotics. Um, insurance companies often will not pay for that care because they have to go to doctors who adhere to a different philosophy of Lyme disease, who are treating outside of the guidelines for Lyme disease. And doctors treat outside the guidelines all the time. But with Lyme disease, you're more likely to get caught up in controversy. controversy. You may get reported by the insurance company to the licensing board. Um, so a lot of doctors don't want anything to do with Lyme disease. They have seen their colleagues reported to boards, brought up on charges. Um, they've heard the scuttlebutt that these guys are quacks, that they and women, that they don't know what they're doing, that they that there really is no such thing as chronic Lyme disease. Now, I don't say that there is something called chronic Lyme disease. There is something going on in the bodies of people who have been treated for Lyme disease and who continue to have symptoms. And it may be that it is a chronic infection, namely that they're still um, actively infected. But it may be other things going on as well, some sort of you know, inflammation, some sort of autoimmune thing. The problem is we haven't spent the time or the money to figure out what it is. I have three questions. First, why is there no response out of individuals or individuals get our politicians, our representatives, to look at this more fully? If there are that many cases, there has to be a way of moving forward. Well, there's a lot of support by you know um, U.S. representatives who, uh, um, well, they, they support um, more funding for Lyme disease, for example. Um, you know, you won't find a uh, representative, I think, in this area, certainly in the Hudson Valley, who says, you know, I don't support Lyme disease research. They all do. But um, it basically competes with a lot of other things. There's now a uh, proposal in Congress by um, Susan Collins of Maine, where Lyme disease is coming on really strong, um, to fund uh, Lyme disease with $100 million a year. And that is more than it has ever gotten. It's not enough. It gets about $25 million a year. So that would be a huge step forward. But on the other hand, New York State had a $1 million for tick-borne um, control and research in its budget, and it was completely eliminated in this final, this new budget. So what we need to do is we need to make a lot of noise. We need to contact our legislators. We need to tell them this is something that you know needs attention. We need to pay attention to it. The other thing I wanted to ask, you have done this study on finding out that the tests are not legitimate the medication that's doing it is are there tests that can tell us what all of these um, uh, insecticides do for the ticks mm -hmm. or do they help the situation do they not help the situation let me let me get to that I have a few more things um, up my sleeve here and and we can talk a little bit more about that um, but we what we need to do is we need to figure out how to control ticks in the wild and there is research going on about that uh, in Dutchess County. Right now there's a $5 million um, study funded by the Cohen Foundation, not by the government, to figure out how to control ticks in, in the areas where we live. So it's studying about 500 different properties in Dutchess County over a five-year period. Um, this um, is a picture of me <laughs> in uh, 1985, standing knee-deep in grass. Do you think I would do that today, holding a baby? No. So, as I said, I have a new relationship with nature, and all of you need to as well. You need to be vigilant. We need to protect children. These are my four grandchildren. My husband is smiling happily in the back. <laughs> um, and they have been told since day one that we need to watch out for ticks, which means don't brush up against that grass at the edge of the trail. Um, tell mommy to check you for ticks, you look for ticks. Um, this is a chart of the age groups that are infected by Lyme disease. And what you'll see is that uh, kids five to nine, 
sort of vie with adults 60 to 64 as the biggest groups that are bitten and infected with Lyme disease. If you take away um, girls from the uh, equation, boys five to nine are the single biggest group infected with Lyme disease. And I've spoken to many, many mothers, to guidance counselors, to physicians, and I've been told of kids who have lost months and sometimes years to Lyme disease because it wasn't caught early. So, a few little tips for you. Be vigilant. Be very careful when you're outside. Don't go walking knee deep in grass. Don't go brushing up against the grass where those little ticks hang out and they're just waiting for you to pass. Um, consider something called permethrin. Um, it can come, you can buy clothing impregnated with permethrin. It is a synthetic chemical from, um, derived from, synthetically from chrysanthemum flowers. Yeah. Um, it is safe. I did a lot of research on it for my book. I write about it in my book. Um, do you have a question? Yes. What do you find is take on your body? What are you supposed to do? Okay, well, um, if it's not attached, you get it off you as quickly as possible. Um, if it's not engorged, well, first of all, you gotta, you gotta remove it correctly. Let's talk about that. And you should have a good set of tweezers. There's a lot of different ones out there. I actually have one. Um, I have a few of them that, that um, I purchased and I'm, I'm willing to sell if anybody wants them. Um, thank you. And, there, it has two um, ends to it, but what you want to do is you want to get under the, the tick as close to your skin as possible and, and pull it up by its neck, for lack of, it doesn't really have a neck, but you know, as close to the skin as possible and gently pull it up. You don't want to squeeze that little critter because whatever is in it will get squeezed right back into your body. And you don't want to put Vaseline on it or alcohol. Those, are the, that's, those will have the same effect on the tick. The tick's going to throw up into you. And that tick is filled with you know, just all sorts of nasty things. So first of all, take it off correctly. Um, the second thing is you kind of got to judge how long has it been there. Do you know how long it's been there? Is it encouraged? Save it for sure. There are lots of different places you can send away to and it, they'll do free tick testing for you. Um, bring it to the doctor also. Do not let the doctor throw it away. I've had doctor, uh, patients who said, oh, that's nothing. Yeah. Threw it away. Uh, it's all part of this Lyme disease is exaggerated thing, you know? Um, but if it's been on you for a while, if it's um, engorged, there are two schools of thought prevailing medicine, mainstream medicine, and that other side that takes this a lot more seriously. And if you go to the doctor, you've been bitten by a tick, the doctor will probably give you two doxycycline pills, 500 milligram pills. Um, it's called a prophylaxis against Lyme disease. There's very thin evidence that it really works. It's based on one study that was never repeated. Other studies in animals show that that is not effective. So if you go to a Lyme doctor, a Lyme doctor will probably give you two weeks of antibiotics, maybe even more, um, depending on how long it's been um, on you. And you know, the, the mainstream side says 24 to 48 hours has got to be on you to give you Lyme disease. Um, in the medical literature, it's been as little as 16 hours, and some docs think it's even shorter than that. It's got to be there a while, though, but go ahead. Once you remove the tick, um, yeah, you should wash it up, yes, uh, disinfect it, um, but um, the big thing is to get it off and to figure out where to go from there, depending on how long um, it's been on you and how engorged it is. The longer it's been on you, the more risk you have undertaken. Yes, uh, you mentioned the test, how it's not really very effective test. The two tests that I'm familiar with are Eliza and the Western Block. Are you referring to one or both? No, I'm, I'm referring to both because that those two tests are the Lyme disease diagnostic method. It's called a two-tier test. First, they give you the ELISA, which basically measures your antibody load in your body. Do you have enough antibodies to indicate, oh, something may be going on? And then they go to the Western blot, 
where they're looking for specific antibodies. They're looking for signs of the Lyme disease bug. Yeah, a few years ago there was a, apparently some, like, I think a urine test where you actually had urine sent out to California and they spun it. There have been a lot of tests that have come along with promise um, and none of them have been able to take the place of this frankly lousy test. And that is a travesty. The, the CDC has not endorsed any other test and the longer it waits, the harder it is for it to do that. When you're talking about people getting something, how long it's been on your body, um, there's a lot of blind people that I deal with, physicians who have been around, international doctors as well, who don't necessarily agree that it has to be 24 or 48 hours. One woman, her son, was bit recently. She was out with him, saw it on him. I don't know, maybe he was there for half an hour. They weren't outside long. Sent him to Colorado. He had two anemia. So he wasn't 24 hours or 48 hours. It was a very short time. And, and that's my point about this isn't just Lyme disease. Right. There are other things right. in these ticks. And the, the ticks are way ahead of us in terms of, you know, uh, being able to do damage to us and us not being able to respond or to, to diagnose. Um, there's another bug in, believed to be in ticks called Bartonella. Bartonella is uh, the or organism responsible for cat scratch fever. It's in a lot of things. It's in a lot of feral cats. Um, and uh, basically cat scratch fever occurs when the, the cat has fleas, the fleas um, defecate on the cat, the cat scratches, and then the cat scratches you. Um, and a lot of us have Bartonella in our bodies, by the way, but our in immune systems manage to keep it under control. But anyway, um, a lot of people with Lyme disease also suffer from Bartonella. Um, and doctors don't even think to look for it. They don't know how to treat it. Um, again, we're just so early on into this, this research um, issue and project, and we just need to ramp it up big time. So, um, yeah, just a few other things. Cover yourself, you know. Um, check for ticks. Um, consider, as I said, the permethrin clothing. You can buy the clothing already impregnated, or you can buy the spray and just um, lay your, your pants out and your socks and your shoes on the driveway. Really um, you soak them with the spray, and it will survive several launderings, maybe eight, ten launderings. The stuff you buy will last a lot longer, um, the clothing that's impregnated, but this works really well. It's very effective, and I do it all the time. I did it last week. Um, Where do you buy it? You can buy it on Amazon. Um, you can buy it in some uh, stores, like I think Walmart, I was told Walmart, Walmart had it. I get mine through Amazon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there's some, there's, um, all right. So anyway, just to finish this up, you know, you have to advocate for yourself. If you think you have Lyme disease, you should insist on being treated. Uh, don't take chances, because this thing gets loose in your body. As I said, it moves all around the body. It hides. Uh, there's research showing it just exists under these biofilms. Um, it changes shape. It just is a very, very clever bug. So just don't let it get out of hand. Um, get informed. Get treated. And this is a fact sheet. You'll find this online if you're interested um, at um, tickencounter.org. It tells you all about permethrin. Or you can just take a little cell phone shot of it. But, okay, any other questions? Uh, you know, there's a lot of those kinds of oils that are used to repel ticks. Um, and there is some evidence that they are effective. There's a whole page on the um, CDC website about um, rosemary oil and oil of clove and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's also something called... What's that? Skin so soft. Skin so soft, yeah, I've heard that. But, you know, I'm not going to, I'd rather go with permethrin um, or like off or D or something like that. Uh, and being careful, just be vigilant, you know. If you do a number of different things, you're going to protect yourself. Rubber boots. Rubber boots, great. That's probably like super, yeah, they, they can't get through that. Um, they did, somebody did a study of uh, these guys in Norway that, that wear these nylon kind of things. They, they do these. I don't know, long distance hikes through the 
the, the wild, and they had an extremely low rate of Lyme disease because the ticks couldn't get through. You mentioned the blossom tick. Blossom. I had it. It led to meningitis. Blossom virus, you had? Wow. But it was caught early, I guess. I'm lucky to be here. Yes, yes, that's good to hear. Uh, yeah. Nantucket, I've heard, uh, you know, 60% of the population on Nantucket has Lyme disease, so they were going to do the mice. Have you yeah. heard anything about the, uh, your dead about a year ago? Yeah, I actually interviewed the uh, scientist who's working on genetically yeah. engineering mice yeah. so that they are effectively born vaccinated yes. with Lyme That's disease. It. And, and um, they're moving forward on it. They're going to try it on a um, uninhabited island before they try it on you know, Nantucket, which, by the way, is number one uh, in terms of U.S., 3,000 counties in the U.S. for Lyme disease. It's also got a terrible babesiosis problem. Um, I don't really hold out much hope, though, for that. I, I, don't, I just don't see how effective it can be in terms of... Remember the Daminex, too? Yeah, yeah. supposed to bring it back to their... And I've used that, too. Like well, that, that's a whole different technology. The, oh, okay. the, the tubes with um, permethrin impregnated um, yes. cotton balls yes. are put they out. They, they bring it back to their nests, and they don't have any um, ticks on them. There's been mixed research on them. In fact, a study just came out last week. It's somewhat effective, but... Uh, I still have the birds, though. Yes. Yeah. Um, spraying can be effective, yes. There are studies showing that that's effective. There's another thing that's coming on the market probably in about a year, is um, the, these little pellets you put out and the, and the mice eat them and it vaccinates them. So we effectively kill Lyme disease in the local mouse population. But getting something like genetically engineered mice to tackle this whole thing on a place that's not an island, maybe it'll work on an island, but can you think to get into your hair? Like, we check our kids. Oh, Obviously, yeah. it's easy to check on the skin, but under the hairline, I imagine. They definitely get into the hair. So, is there a way you to know, check? I mean, no. Look, you've got dark, <laughs> lots of dark hair. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing. Um, that's not a really great, you know, way to avoid getting Lyme disease showering, you know, because they they can hold on pretty tightly. As I said in my TED talk, I um, talk about the wonders of tick saliva. And this is how the tick and the organism sort of work together. Um, the saliva basically um, numbs you, so you don't feel when this thing is poking at you. Um, it, it's an anticoagulant, which lets the blood flow back and forth. It also um, disables your immune system in certain key ways that lets the, the organism cross into your body. And it creates this little cement ring around the bite so that the, the tick doesn't fall off because it gets about 100 times its size. So, yes. What about uh, people pulling the ticks off? Is that pulling dead ticks off? Um, no, a dead tick will fall off you. Yeah? We should do a study on you to find out what it is. Well, I know a researcher has bitten, been bitten about 200 times, and he always says that he should be the focus of a scientific study. Uh -huh. There are some people with a natural immunity, and we don't know why, because it also seems to run in families. There are families where Lyme disease is rampant bad cases of Lyme disease. So there is some thought that it, there may be a genetic predisposition or anti-disposition. How much of the research has been perceived? I mean, I, I know climate change is a very risky subject in some audiences, so how has it been received? It's been well, re it's been well received. Um, the book has gotten pretty good reviews. The problem is getting my message out into the mainstream. Um, I've written a number of articles, but editors are, are sometimes a little bit leery about you know me taking on the the CDC and the New England Journal of Medicine and the you know because I really am challenging mainstream medicine with my message. 
I have a lot of science behind me, and that's why I feel comfortable doing it. But um, it's hard to get my message through to the mainstream press. The lady here asked about, you know, why isn't being moved forward a little bit more? You know, you always have to go back to uh, where does the where does the money? You know, you're mm -hmm. saying the money for research, and just from pure experience with my life work. Um, there's people that tend to worry about where that money's coming from or who's getting the money. And yeah. the CDC and their guidelines certainly well, definitely have a... Uh, there's a follow the money idea connected with this. And this is the last thing I'll, I'll say, and then I think we'll wrap up. There's a lawsuit right now against the Infectious Diseases Society of America um, and um, six of the prime line researchers and eight insurance companies. It's a federal lawsuit in Texas. And it asserts that, and it's gone pretty far into the court system right now, that these, these entities conspired to deny people care for Lyme disease. And they did it um, because of the financial considerations that um, these researchers worked for the insurance companies. They denied claims. They crafted the guidelines with the insurance companies. Now, I, you know, I don't say that that's the reason we're in the problem that we are in. That's part of what has happened, um, but um, it, it's a lot bigger than that. And I think it really goes back to the, the, these researchers who got there first, who have the power, and who very stubbornly are clinging to it. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you all. That was one of the most impressive talks that we've had here. Thank you very much for coming. I think we've all learned a lot. And I want to let you know that this, in, within a few weeks, this will be posted on the library's website. We can show you how to find that when the time comes. But so tell other people about it. I also want to mention that we're delighted that at least two people, and perhaps more, affiliated with Southampton Hospital are here this evening. And one of them, Rebecca Young, raise your hand, Rebecca, is a one-person dynamo with Lyme disease. And so, and I've had the experience lately of calling on her expertise, and she is very much in, she seems to be, yeah, she, she is very, in, her, her views seem to be in line with many of the things you've been saying. So. If you have, if you live locally and you have Lyme disease question, they have a, a, a telephone number, I think it's 726-KICK, and you'll get Rebecca, and she is a wonderful resource, and so is our hospital, but I can't thank you enough for coming here, and thank you all for being here to hear her. Okay, thank you.